All right, we're, we're continuing on with our, our verse-by-verse study uh, through the book of Colossians. And this morning we'll begin in Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, and hopefully you do, I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to begin at verse 1. In chapter 3 and 4, we're going to see Paul speak of the practical side of theology. In chapters 1 and 2, he spoke of his doctrinal theology, uh, where we learned of the preeminence of Christ. We saw Jesus as a member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we've seen him as both God and man, and in preeminence in creation, because he is the creator, amen? Amen. Uh, He's preeminent in redemption, because he is the redeemer. We just celebrated that during communion. He is also preeminent in the church because he's the one who gave himself for the church. And now in chapter 3, we come to the place where Paul insists that he must be made preeminent in our daily lives. That word preeminent, in case you don't know, means to put him above or before all others. It means to be superior or surpassing of everything. And so we're going to learn today and in chapters uh, 3 and 4 that Paul is encouraging us, he's exhorting us to make Christ preeminent now in our daily lives, every single day. And so if we say that we're Christians and we declare that Christ is preeminent in our life, then we must be dedicated. Say that word to somebody, dedicated. We must be dedicated to living out the life, our life through him. Amen. 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 Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And so it, it takes dedication to do that. It takes being determined to do that. It takes like setting your mind and putting your hands to the plow and moving forward and saying, I am determined every moment of every day to live my life out the best I can for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So that the world around me can see the Jesus that's living in me. How many of us understand that, uh, that if we declare that we're Christians, but then when we go outside these four walls into our workplace and into our schools and in other places like that, and we don't act like Christians, we don't live our life out as Christians, and we act like the people around us, the world that is, then we're not making a very good declaration of who Christ is, are we? And in fact, it's a little blasphemous, I think, to to say that you are and then to live otherwise. And so Paul is teaching us here in chapter 3 that we need to, if we say that we are, then we need to be dedicated to do the best of our ability to live out what we say that we are. Amen? Amen. Amen. We've got to be real because there's a lost and dying world out there that needs Jesus. They don't need us to act like uh, 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 we are and then, uh, I mean, say that we are and act differently. They need, us, they need to see the Jesus that we preach. They need to see the Jesus that lives in us come alive through us. And then they may be drawn to what we know. Amen? Otherwise, it, it, it doesn't do any good. The church has been hidden inside the box of the four walls. And it's time that we get out into the highways, into the byways, and to share the love of God. And the way that we share the love of God is how we live and act out in the community that God has placed us in. Amen? And so Paul makes this very clear in Colossians chapter 2. If you go to that first side, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Amen? So so we're made full in him. And and we are also complete in him. And therefore he has made us ready. Remember a couple weeks ago I said he's made us ready for the voyage of life in him. Amen? Amen. And and we, we have got to set our sails. 
and, 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 and catch the wind of the Holy Spirit and move forward. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, Paul says who is the head of all principality and power. And so we got all we need once we get born again. Amen. We don't need anything else. He's already done it all. He's already, uh, he's not going to, he's not doing any more. The work is done. When he said it's finished on the cross, that's what he said. It's finished. And so we have to dig in the word. We have to see what God has made available to us in Christ Jesus, get a hold of it and set the sail and catch the wind of the Holy Spirit and move forward in the things of God. Amen? And so we're made full in Him. We are also complete in Him. And, and so when, because of this, we can go through the, uh, uh, the, the voyage of life. Full sail. Full sail. Amen? Somebody got it back there. Now, in chapters 1 and 2, Paul made it very clear that the Christian life means to live out the life of Christ. And when we do, we, we find that all we need is in Jesus. All we need. When we live out, <laughs> let, me, let me say this, man, maybe, maybe, I can, maybe it'll sink in here a little bit. Uh, it, when we live uh, the Christian life out, when we're living what I just shared with you, when we're living like Paul explains uh, to us how to live. When we do that, this amazing thing happens. It, it, it's one of the mysteries of God that happens. And what happens is we find out that everything that you and I need, we have in Jesus Christ. When we, when we dedicate ourselves to live out the life that Paul's teaching us to live, we find that everything we need is in Him. We don't need all this other stuff. That's all we need is Jesus. And then when we live like He asks us to live, He fulfills our needs. It's a promise from God. He supplies every need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen on that, church? So now, let's, uh, he starts out, Paul starts out, in verses 1 and 2, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he starts out by saying, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Amen. And so as I look over my life and as I've been able to look at others who have, you know, God's allowed to come into my life and out of my life and over the years, and as you saw in some of those cards, I've been around for a while. And, um, and so as I've experienced life and people and so forth, uh, I can conclude that those who are content people, that those that I've known in this lifetime so far, those who are content people really enjoy this life. And those who are, uh, ha have set their hearts and their minds on the things which are above, where Christ is sitting, they're, they're, they're basically really content people. Now others that have come in and out of my life and, uh, and, and that are, appear to be often frustrated and their lives are kind of messed up, if I could use that word, trusting in the things that they purchased never quite brought them the happiness that they desired. Amen. Yeah, have you found that out as well? Can you bring me down just a little bit, Bill? Uh, in other words, the happiness that they provided only lasted a short period of time. Those things that we go out and buy, those things that we get, man, you know, I'm going to get this new car. I've been waiting for this car all my life, man. <laughs> I saved up for it. Man, this is, this is it, man. I'm going to be so happy just cruising around <laughs> in this new car, man. I'm cranking up the music and everything. My cell phone rings. Hey, can you stop by the store, honey, and pick up some milk? Sure. I pull into the grocery store. I park the car. I go inside, get some milk. I come back out. What? Somebody ran a shopping cart basket into the door and put a big ding in my new car. That was it, man. My, all my happiness disappeared just like that. Right? When we put our heart and our soul into the things of this world and we expect those things to bring us real happiness, we get disappointed, don't we? 
Come on, church. We get disappointed, don't we? Amen? And they only last for a short period of time. So the dreams that, 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 that those folks have pursued didn't become as satisfying as they thought they would be. And I, I was once like that. And nothing ever seemed quite right until the day that I turned on, until the day that uh, the light turned on, the light bulb came on, and I realized happiness is not found in the things of this world. I, I believe this is why we see over and over again in the scripture, in the word of God, a reminder of setting our hearts on the things that are above. Paul says this, he weaves this in and out of just about everything that he wrote. On the other hand, people are bogged down when they set their minds on the things of this world. They're, they're bogged down, man. They're frustrated. They're, their stomachs are churning. Their, their hearts are breaking because they, they, they're, they're taking life here on earth much too seriously. And it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, house you live in, or, or skateboard that you ride. All of that is irrelevant, you guys. What matters is if you were raised with Christ, as Paul says here, seek those things that are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now listen, when, when we see heaven as our, our finish line, and for me it's getting closer and closer every day, but when we see heaven as our finish line, then we are free to enjoy this life, you guys. Live for heaven and, you, and, and you'll find this life much more enjoyable. Can I get an amen, church? So let's go on to verse 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I like the way the Amplified Bible reads this verse. It says on, on the next slide, I believe... It says, for you died to this world, and your new, real life is hidden with Christ in God. Yes. Amen. When Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 2.20, he, he said, I am crucified with Christ. That's what he said. Think about that. Think about what he's saying. Uh, as I was studying, I, I, I just pondered on that for a minute, and I thought, Paul says, I... I, I, I am crucified with Christ. If we were crucified with Christ, then we died more than 2,000 years ago when he died because he took our place. That's right. Amen. And now our life is hidden in Christ, in God. With Christ in God, I should say. We have been taken out of the old man. Amen the old Adam, and placed in Jesus Christ. Yes. We, we are now in Christ, and now we are in Christ. We should, now that we are, we should have, uh, and sh we should live out this life and let his fullness be lived out through us. Yes. Yes. Every single day. Amen? Amen? Amen. Second Corinthians 5.17, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, man. That old man, that old Adam has passed away. And behold, all things now have become new. Everything is new. Man, every day, uh, you know, the Bible says that, that, uh, that if we read the scripture every day, we, we get this joy that rises up in us, right? And, 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 and my uh, tender, his tender mercies are renewed each and every morning. It's a new day every day. It's something exciting to look forward to. And so, because we now uh, have become new in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how long you've known him, you guys, it's a new day, man. Turn to somebody and say, it's a new day today. God has something good for you. Amen? So, in this verse, as well as the first four verses in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is demonstrating the life-changing power that there is in this new resurrected life that we have in Jesus Christ. And so the, the, the heretics 
remember, they were trying to pull the Colossians away from something that Christ in them paid for when he died on the cross at Calvary. And then they rose, and when he rose from the dead, they were trying to discredit all of these teachings, all of uh, uh, the, the basic things that uh, we, we, we believe in as Christians, that he was crucified on the cross, that he was buried, and that on the third day he rose from the dead. The heretics were coming in and saying, no, 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 Christ alone is not a good enough. And, 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 and Paul is letting them know that our identification is in Christ by his death to the past and our empowerment for the present by his resurrection. You guys follow me on that? And, and so listen, the new creation is only a practical experience, but it should be our focus as we move forward uh, towards the completion of the, uh, of the promise that God has made to us. In other words, God, this, this new created person that we've become in Christ Jesus is something that we can look forward to every single day. And so as we move forward into this, this life, this new life that we have in Jesus Christ, as we continue to press on and move forward to it, behold, all things become new. Amen? All, all, old things have passed away. Have you ever noticed that you're not interested in, those, in, in a lot of the things that, I mean, it's easy to lose interest in those real bad sinful things that we always partook, partook in, right? I mean, it should be. Those should be easy to discard in our life. And then there's another level of sinfulness that is just, you know, kind of some things that, uh, we're, we're not fully committed to Christ or it's just part of our nature and then we, God reveals those little things to us along our journey and then we need to take care of those as well, right? And so that's what behold all things have become new is all about. It's not just the day you got born again. That's part of it. But man, this is a journey, right? We're on, we're on a journey and every day is a new day. And behold, all things have become new. And when I wake up in the morning, I say, God, it's a new day. And all things have become new. I'm leaving that old stuff behind, and I want to see what you got for me today. Amen? And that's what Paul, that's what Paul is sharing with them. And the older I get, the more I understand this verse. And just because we're getting older, it doesn't mean that we should be sad. Let me, read, let me go back and read... 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says this, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, now listen, that the inward man is being renewed day by day. And so as I said, the older I get, I understand this verse better every day. Just because we're getting older on the outside doesn't mean that we should be sad. But we should be happy that we are getting closer to our heavenly home. Amen? And, 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 and we're being renewed day by day. It's a new day. Turn to somebody and say, it's a new day. And I'm being renewed today. I'm being renewed. And so Paul says, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, listen. Listen. Even though that's happening in our lives, and it doesn't matter how old you are, every day your outward man is perishing. Yeah. That's right. You have less, every day that you live, you have less life to live. Yeah. And so even though that's happening, something very cool is also happening at the same time. And that is our inward man is being renewed day by day. And, and so how does that happen? You have to get into the Word. Amen. You have to spend time with Jesus. You have to, to in order to, to get your mind renewed by the washing of the Word, you have to spend time in it. And, and, and i got to tell you something, that when you spend time with Jesus and you spend time in His Word, that's what happens. Your inward man begins to soar like an eagle. Because it's being renewed each and every day. Your outward man may be perishing, but your inward man is running, it's flying. Amen? 
And so even though my body is wearing down, my inward man, my, my esothen, the Greek word means soul. My esothen, my soul is being renewed, strengthened, and it's built up every single day, day by day. Amen? Amen. So God is getting us ready to transition into our new bodies is what's happening so that we can leave this body, we can leave this tent, transition from this one that is subject to perishing into the one that is immortal. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 and 54. It says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Let me say it in modern day vernacular. It's all good. All is well with me. Amen? Amen? I said all that to shed light on what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 and 4, chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Let me look at that one more time. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Amen. It's talking about when Christ comes again. So here's the thing, guys. The days are going by very rapidly, right? We're going to see Jesus soon. And when we do, we'll say, this is it. This is what I've been craving for all my life. This is it. And so that's why Paul says, heaven is where your heart should be. Your your mind should be fixed on the things above, not on the things of this earth. And so heaven is where our hearts should be. When Christ appears, it's going to be a glorious time, you guys. So that we are to do, what we are to do is to to stay connected to Jesus because he is shaping and he's molding us for that day when we transition from this life into our next life. Day by day, I'm being renewed. So even though, now listen, this is a revelation that I got while I was doing this study. Even though every day this body is deteriorating and getting older and wearing out, my soul, my inner man, is being renewed day by day. And, 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 and he's getting me ready to transition from this body into my next body, into my new body. That's an immortal body. It's going to live forever with Jesus Christ. Never going to get sick. Amen. No, there's no, how many know there's no doctors in heaven? They're, they're all retired when they get there. Because Dr. Jesus has made us all well. Amen? So praise God for that. So, John 15, 4 says this. He, Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you as, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And so we're to stay connected to Jesus every single day. The word abide isn't a common word that you and I would use every day in our our vocabulary. But it means to remain in him and not to drift away, to be kept. That's what it means. To abide means to be kept and to be one with him. That's what he's saying. Be one with me. Let me keep, let me me take care of you. Have you heard people say something like, Like this life in Christ isn't a sprint, but it's a long distance race, right, man? It's a marathon. Why? Because it requires endurance and persistence and perseverance and all those things that it takes to to do the long haul. 
with Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Hebrews 10, 36 says this, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Amen. Whoo! Yeah. Amen. Amen. Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says to put to death your members on, uh, that are on this earth. In, in the first four verses of this chapter, Paul, he, he exhorts us on how to live for heaven, right? Right? And in the remainder of the chapter, he turns our, our attention now. He makes a change on how we should live this current life that we have on earth. Amen. And so he says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Now Paul turns this practical uh, a teaching to the practical consequences of living as Christians should live, how we should live practically on this earth. Paul makes it very clear now. Remember, his friends in Colossae were being persuaded <clears throat> by these heretics that <clears throat> Jesus alone wasn't enough. They came in and they started teaching these young Christians, Jesus alone isn't enough. You guys are missing it. You had to add all these rules and regulations and feasts to truly be saved. And so Paul made a very clear, vivid demand, and he says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, he says. And then he, he names some of the things that need to be put out of a Christian's life. He says fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Something we all need to understand and we all need to agree upon as born-again Christians is this. Now listen very carefully. The New Testament never hesitates to demand the complete elimination of everything which is against God. And that's why it's okay to speak out in love, publicly or otherwise, against the things that are against God. Amen. That are trying to push God out and let all these other creepy things in. Amen. So the original King James Version of the Bible <coughs> translates the first part of, of, of verse 5 like this. It says, mortify your members. Mortify your members. In the 17th century uh, English, the people understood exactly what that meant, mortify. We don't use that word. Any, uh, um, you might say, I'm, I'm mortified. <laughs> you don't say Mor mortify your members. We don't use that, that, that kind of word. But back then, in the 17th century English, the people understood exactly what that meant. And, 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 and however, today, it, it, it's lost its meaning, and it has turn more to an ascetic uh, meaning, which is self-denial and bringing harm to yourself. We've mentioned that throughout this teaching so far. And so to mortify your bodies, they knew exactly what it meant. But today when we see that, we, we think it's crawling on your knees for miles until they're all bloody and you can't <laughs> crawl anymore. That's not what was happening. Paul is saying is to put to death every part of yourself that is against God. And, and keeps you from fulfilling his will in your life. Paul said, he said it like this in the letter to the Romans in, in Romans chapter 8, 13. He said, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, then you're going to live. And so it's exactly the same line of thought when Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 29 and 30. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for you, your whole body to be cast into hell. The idea uh, stressed here is the severity of, uh, of living a clean and ho holy life. It, it, it's, 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 
we need to be sincere about that. We need to be determined about that. And, and this is what's being stressed in the scripture, is that we, we change. The old things have passed away. Amen? We've got to get that down. I know sometimes the, these verses are kind of elementary, but we've got to get a hold of it. Old things have passed away have passed away, man. I, I, I'm, I'm pushing further and further away from my old life and all those sinful things. Behold, new things are coming about. Amen? New things are happening in my life. And, and, and he says, therefore put to death your, your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, are you tracking with me on this, you guys? Yes. Colossians 3.6 says, Of these things, now listen, of these things that Paul just mentioned, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Yes. So Paul is speaking of things that he just mentioned. He's mentioned fornication. The Greek word is pornea. Now this is interesting, which is where we get our English word porn. That's where it comes from. They, for fornication. And it means illicit sexual intercourse, voluntary sexual intercourse between two people not married to each other. Fornication. That's where we get our English word porn from. Pornea is the Greek word. And, 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 and Paul, listen, it's not okay. Amen. It's not okay. It's not. Fornication is not okay. And, and, and Paul, Paul says that because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So, man, if you, if, you're dis, if you read the word, now let me say this to you. If you read the word and you see something, what, is, what does disobedient mean? We've got we to gotta get an understanding of that. Disobedient means like if your mom and dad ask you to do something and you reject what they ask you to do, then you're being disobedient to them. Same thing with the Word of God. If you're disobedient to the Word of God, then Paul says because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Amen? Amen. And so I, I, I'm going to go to the next sin that he mentions, which is uncleanness. And the Greek word is akatharsia, which means immoral, impurity, lustful, and shamelessly reckless. That's what that means. The next word that he mentions is passion. And if you use the King James Version, it says inordinate affection instead of passion. And so the Greek word is pathos. And it means whatever one feels like. In other words, if it feels good, do it. And, 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 and it's a depraved and vile passion. It's like when lust overtakes you. Amen. And so the next word Paul mentions is evil desire. The Greek word is kekos, which means in, injurious, like injured. It's bad for you. It's destructive. How many of you understand that sin kills? Amen. And so evil desire is injurious to one's health. It's destructive. It's destructive. It's being of bad nature. And that's what that word means. And then the last is covetousness, which is a greedy desire to have more. Right? Got to have more. Not satisfied. Got to have more of this, got to have more of that, got to have a bigger car, got to have a bigger house and a bit faster car, all that kind of stuff. And the last one is idolatry, which is the worship, obviously, of false gods. And so Paul very clearly says in Colossians 5, 3, 5, and 6, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Come on now. Yeah. It's no joke. When God speaks, we need to listen and obey. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And so I'm going to finish up by reading verses 7 uh, through 9, and then I'm going to go, I mean, 7 through 11, I'm sorry. And here's what it says. It says, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, talking about the way we used to live, but now you yourselves are put, you are put to put off all those things. And then he mentions some other things like anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. 
do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, I don't know what that is. Slave, I, I meant to look it up, but I don't know what it is. I'll figure it out, though. Slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Yeah. Amen? So those of us know we all practiced these sins, or some of them, at some point in our lives before we knew Christ. And I hope that nobody's practicing them now after you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. But Paul says... We once walked past tense in these sins. And, and, and these sins must not mark, as I said in the beginning, a Christian's life. Yes. Those things must not mark our lives. And so Paul tells us to put them off. Put them off, these, these sins. He says, put them off. Right? In the same manner that we would, you know, go into our closet and uh, try on a a shirt and for some reason it got shrunk in the laundry and it doesn't fit anymore and we were to put it off we're to take it off we're to, to give it away we're to, to do something with it get rid of it get it out of the closet it doesn't fit anymore it's no good it's of no further use for me amen so he says put off these sins and so we are, we are different people now amen and that means when anger he names all these other things uh, when anger, wrath, malice, bad language shows up uh, in us, we need to deal with it as, it, as if it were an alien, you know, intruder, that, uh, somebody that broke into our home, and we need to say, get out of God's temple right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. When, when you feel anger, when you feel these things coming in and trying to intrude into your life, you, you need to put your foot down and say, in the name of Jesus, you get out of God's house right now. You are the temple of God. Amen? And, and that stuff is not to be dwelling in your temple. Amen? And so uh, we, we're to take off the old man and put on the new man that has been renewed in knowledge, you see and hungry to know what God says in his word. We're hungry people. How many of you are hungry? You're probably, you're, and, and you're probably hungrier now than when you were when you first came in, right? But I want you to be hungry for God's word. Amen? And that's what Paul is saying. And, and, and without the knowledge of God's word, the heart cannot be good. We, we need to get, we need to get, I think Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 2, I think, speaks about that. Without the knowledge of God's word, our heart cannot be good. Renew in me, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen. Psalms 55, I think, or something like that. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So as we do these things, Paul is that, that he's sharing with us here in this, these passages, uh, we become renewed in our knowledge of God. And when we are renewed in knowledge, it wipes out all, listen, when we're renewed, and, and Paul, I'm going to share this lap, verse 11, it's, it's amazing. Maybe you never thought of it this way. But, but, but I believe this is one of the things that we miss that, that it's meant to show us. It's when we renew our, our, our minds in, in the knowledge of God's word, it wipes out all racism. And we see God created all people equal. And that's why Paul says, now look at, in verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so, you remember the vision that uh, Peter got when he was on the rooftop? 
and and God lowered down the sheet with all the different animals in it. And 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 Peter says, "Oh, I can't, I can't touch those. I can't eat any of those." And God says, "Peter, what I've made clean is clean indeed." Amen. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Let me tell you something. All people are created equal, my friends. God loves everybody. And we're to do that same thing too. So if you are a born again believer and Jesus Christ indwells in you, then, then and, and there's a stitch of racism going on in you, you need to stamp that out very quickly and say, be gone from me. I'm moving in this direction. My mind has been renewed in the things of God. Amen.